All right. So it looks like we have a couple of attendees. And uh, we're looking for waiting just a little bit longer here. People are coming in at the moment. Uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. I see people as they're coming in here, uh, waiting on just a few more. I don't want to get ahead of myself to to um, get this get this webinar started. But we want to thank you first off for for attending today. Um, this is very exciting. We've put together some talent um, that be able to put on this presentation for us in this webinar. You know, with everything that's going on, this is a great way of means of communication. Um, some of the things that we're gonna be able to do after the fact, those of you who have additional questions, you're gonna have the ability to reach out to some of these folks directly and, and speak to them. Um, I'm also recording this uh, webinar. So if you, uh, we'll, we'll send you a link and follow up uh, just so you can have this information if need be, or if you wanna share it with somebody else or maybe someone who was, just didn't have the opportunity to make it. Um, you know, we're, my name is Ben Reeder. I'm actually the uh, digital marketing manager for the RG Group. I'm one of the marketing team who helped kind of put this all together. Um, my expertise does not lie in the IO link or this type of technology. I'm more of a geek squad today. So I'm not gonna be talking much. I'm just the IT guy that, that's gonna help, uh, help bring these guys together. So. I first want to introduce um, one of the folks from our group because we have um, we have Pete Wheeler here with us today. Uh, Pete's um, a, a RG Group's pneumatic product specialist, as well as we have two gentlemen from Parker Hannifin. So I'm going to hand this over to Pete. And Pete, why don't you uh, um, give yourself an introduction and, and introduce our guests? Will do. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. So uh, again, Absolutely. thanks everybody for taking time. Um, I know it's uh, with everything going on, this is uh, kind of the new way that we like to communicate with folks. Um, and hopefully you'll find this very beneficial and very interesting. Um, so again, I'm the product manager um, for uh, pneumatic products here at the RG Group. Uh, been with RG Group coming up on 23 years, have so been in the industry for quite a while. Um, but even as long as I've been uh, involved with pneumatics and in this product line, we've, uh, we've actually brought in uh, Two, two big heavy hitters from Parker. So these are part of the national team um, from Parker. And again, folks that are really on the cutting edge of Iowa Link. Um, so uh, again, we trust that you'll find this very, very worthwhile. Um, the first gentleman is Ushwin Rain. He is the industrial network product manager um, with Parker Hannifin. And uh, the gentleman who will be say leading most of the presentation, his name is Jim Siri. He's the senior controls engineer with Parker. Um, so these gentlemen will be running that. Um, Ushwin will be monitoring the questions as they come up. So feel free um, as questions come up, um, use the Q&A link below. So if you just move your mouse um, to like the bottom center of the screen, you'll see Q&A pops up. Feel free to click on that. Um, enter in questions that you have because you know, as, as we're talking about things, as it's fresh on your mind and maybe as we have the slide up, um, we, can, we can certainly stop take that question, answer it right there, rather than waiting to the end. So we wanna make sure that we're answering your questions uh, quickly and as uh, efficiently as we can. So uh, we'll get, without further ado, um, I will turn this over to Ashwin Rain. Thank you, Ashwin. Thank you very much, Pete. Hey everyone, my name is Ashwin Rane. Thank you, good day to everyone. Thanks for joining this. Um, my, I am the Industrial Networks Product Sales Manager for Parker Hannifin Pneumatic Division. Um, and we have an exciting topic here today. We deal a lot with industrial connectivity uh, within the pneumatic universe. And something that we have been really excited about is a new protocol, not, not so new, but new in our universe called IO Link. Um, we do a lot of different things, but we wanna take some time. I'm gonna hand this over to Jim Siri, one, uh, one of us, uh, six global controls engineers that we have at our disposal. Uh, to really make sure our customers are educated and are supported when they're trying to use new innovations like this, IO Link, um, and uh, some of our products. So that being said, uh, I'm going to look after the chats and the Q&A. Uh, we're going to go ahead and hand it over to Jim. If you have a question, put it in there. I'll interject and we'll try to answer it or we'll get it at the end. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ashwin. Uh, again, my name is Jim Siri and uh, I'm going to throw up, just to give everybody a background of, of who's talking here, um, I'm a senior automation controls engineer with Parker. Uh, I spent seven years with Balif, 
Uh, not that you would know Ballot necessarily. Um, one of the things I like to do when I, I first start a presentation is to ask who, who has actually heard of IOLink, who uh, has possibly used or even deployed IOLink. Obviously in this format, it's a little more difficult, but um, basically I've had a number of years with IOLink. IOLink has been out for about 12, 14 years now. It's not new technology, but it's new to a lot of people still. Um, but I've been, I did uh, a number of years with General Motors, uh, controls work. Uh, I was in the welding industry for a while, the industrial power supply industry. Uh, so that's just a little bit of my background as we get into this. Um, IOLink, one of the things that IOLink brings to the table is it's vendor neutral. And I'm gonna use an analogy here in a, in a couple of minutes that may better define what that means. Um, but also the, the next thing, these are kind of bullet points that we'll be covering as we go through the presentation. So kind of brought them back to the, the, the beginning just to kind of show you how, how this is gonna be laid out. But basically, IOLink builds on your existing infrastructure as well. It's not like you have to throw everything out, uh, start with a fresh piece of paper uh, and, and start building all over again. It actually builds on to what you have existing. Um, provides auto parameterization. Uh, which is which is really huge when it comes to the smart factory, uh, especially when you get into a lot of smart devices. That interface is is critical, and IOLink actually lends itself right into that. Um, also, diagnostics, uh, and, and we'll show examples of this to where you've got sensors that currently are basically we'll call it on off. Is something there? Is it not there? Uh, I mean, it's there, I've seen many sensors, uh, but, but basically it's usually an on off type thing. This, this changes everything. Um, and then of course, cost is always uh, a consideration and IOLink is a very economical solution and we'll get into that as well. Um, the universal part of it, basically I, I like to use the analogy of uh, it's industrial USB. Uh, everybody's familiar with USB. I'd like to just throw out there that basically everybody is, is being familiar with it is just because you have a Dell PC doesn't mean you go buy Dell USB devices. You just buy a, anybody's device. If it's a USB uh, form factor, it, it'll work and you plug it in. The other part is uh, it is the plug and play. Um, so with IOLink, which we'll, we'll get into here, it consists of masters, which would be the analogy of your, your PC and devices, which would be your USB devices you're plugging in. Um, basically, when you plug in a, a USB device, you don't set a node, you don't set an IP, you don't set a baud rate, you just plug it in. And of course, there's, there's always a driver that, that needs to be either loaded. A lot of times it's already on your PC and it may auto load. Uh, IOLink is the same thing is what, when you plug it in, yes, there's no addressing when you plug it in. Uh, so from a maintenance standpoint, you plug it in, but there's something in the background that's, that supports it. Um, actually, IOLink has a, a, web, a web page. You can go to IOLink.com. And this, we're just, I just threw up, uh, this is kind of a, a cut sheet off of their website. These are just a lot of manufacturers that are already supporting IOLink. This, this list continues to grow. Um, and as you look at, at the companies, they're gonna be uh, one of two things. They're gonna be either a manufacturer or a provider of masters, IOLink master modules, or IOLink devices. Uh, and, and some are both. Um, most of them are IOLink devices. So what they're doing is they're taking their existing product line and they're offering the IOLink interface on what may have been a field bus. Uh, interface before. Okay. And, and the key here is IOLink is not a network. Whenever we talk to the companies, um, one of the comments we get is, you know, my maintenance guys, they've been around a long time. They, they don't, they don't want to learn a new network. And I'll just turn it right back around and say, it's not a network. It's, it's basically, it relies on one of your existing networks. And I'll touch on that here in a second. And right here, so basically, this is where it actually 
relies on your existing infrastructure or your existing networks. Um, there are this, this, what you see in front of you, the Ethernet IP, Profinet, uh, EtherCAT, IE field are your, and Modbus TCP IP are your Ethernet based field buses. Um, you have the legacy DeviceNet, Profibus, and CC Link, which are your serial field buses. They are still supported. Um, but as we move forward, uh, everybody is moving towards Ethernet. But the, the point is, is you need one of these networks. One of these field buses in IO Link actually re resides below that. So what happens is the master module, um, and they come in different form factors, uh, different IP ratings, whatever it might be, um, there's a field bus connection to those. So your maintenance guys uh, are already familiar with whatever exists in their plant type thing, or you know, if you're an integrator or a build shop, basically this is what you've been designing for years. Okay. Uh, this is actually where, again, it's the analogy of industrial USB. Uh, it's a serial bus. And a lot of times when I'll, I'll throw out that it's, it's a serial bus, you get a puzzled look on people's face and it's like, why would I want to put RS-232 or 485 or 422 out, out there on my machine? That's the worst idea there is. Big difference is those are all five volt peak to peak protocols. IO Link is a 24 volt peak to peak protocol. So actually the amount of noise it takes to disturb a 24 volt signal relative to a five volt, sig uh, five volt signal, it's exponential. And it basically it's known as virtually noise immune. There are some applications uh, to where some manufacturers have come out with some special uh, products, but basically uh, applications that have been, or you have to let's say use special consideration are usually the continuous welding, MIG and TIG welding. Even resistance welding, spot welding is not even an issue. Um, but when you get into, in, into where you've got a turntable and all your cables have to route down through the middle, you can't separate your power cables from your, your uh, communication cables. It, you know, it's, I, I just use stuff to design for that. And there, are, there is actually product out there to handle, handle that. But basically, in a, basically when it comes out, it, I don't think it's virtually noise immune because of the 24 volt peak-to-peak uh, -peak signal. Um, the other thing, because of that, you don't have to use shielded cables. So you don't need the, and this is where when it comes into cost, um, you don't need the expensive network cables. So you will still need the network cable coming to the master module, but that's it. Uh, these IO-Link devices, which may have been on the network before, you buy a less expensive version of them. You use a, an unshielded, you know, we, we, I, I throw up there prox cord, tool cord, sensor cable. Uh, everybody's got their own little, uh, you know, pet name for the cables that are in the crib. Um, it's just a, basically a four, usually a four conductor or a five conductor unshielded tool cord. Okay. Um, the IO-Link spec, uh, and obviously this is what everybody's got to live by when they're putting product on the market, uh, does specify 20 meters is the max length for the IO-Link cable, which is going between uh, the master and the device. That does not take into account the network cable coming to the master itself, that those are under the guidelines of the field bus. Okay, uh, this is, just a kind of a layout in a, in a couple things that this shows is the PLC in, in the upper left. What it does is there's modules that you have to buy, expensive PLC modules normally, discrete IO, not so, so much so, but when you get to analog and specialty modules. And what it's showing is that those can be eliminated. So when you do a, a cost comparison between an IO link solution and a traditional uh, field bus solution, you don't need to buy analog cards. You don't need, to, and, and actually the, the discrete cards, which are usually cost effective, those normally aren't purchased either, unless you've got IO locally in your PLC cabinet. Um, and then again, specialty, you've got counter, high-speed counter uh, cards, uh, whatever, you've got thermal couple cards, very popular modules for PLCs that can be eliminated. So basically what it's showing is that you've got an IO link equivalent of that. Uh, so you've got analog modules, discrete modules, valve manifolds uh, down in the lower left there. 
showing a handful of the the IOLink product out there, but it's 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 actually like I say, it, it says many more. I mean, you've got a lot of laser uh, transducer, linear transducer, uh, pressure, temperature, flow, uh, RFID. These are all products that are offered uh, with an IOLink interface. Um, and it's a the other thing to keep in mind, it is a point-to-point -point, uh, connectivity. It's a star topology, which means it's not daisy chainable. Um, there are products out there where you can go to a proprietary bus. So you come out of the PLC to a head module, and then you can daisy chain out. That's not what IOLink is. Uh, IOLink is a one-for-one. -one. So basically, another way to look at it is look at it as a rack in the field. So in a slot, in a rack, you can only plug in or slide in one module. Same thing with the port on a master module, I can only plug in one thing. So am I gonna plug in an RFID? Am I gonna plug in an analog, a valve manifold? Whatever it might be, it's a star topology once it comes to the master itself. Um, and it's a scalable architecture, meaning uh, as far as masters, modules on the market, the common ones are four port masters, eight port masters. Um, there could be other, other varieties, but four and eight are the, are the common ones. If you have an eight port master, you've only used six of the ports, scalable in that you don't have to buy any more hardware. You don't have to really do any more uh, configuration because the port's been there. Right now, basically anything that would, have, would come over that port is in the packet being exchanged between the master and the PLC. All you have to do is plug in an IOLink device to add to the, your, your existing architecture, to expand on something, um, and then write the logic in the, for the mapping that, that's already showing up and being used. Um, because, and because we're eliminating all these modules, uh, you, you, you can't necessarily eliminate the PLC enclosure, but you, you can possibly reduce the size of it, save money there, but even junction boxes, going out and picking up, uh, you know, point IO or, or whatnot out around the cell or the machine, depending on the size of, of the process, you can uh, reduce junction boxes uh, a lot of the time. Okay. Um, diagnostics. Um, IO link and at the bottom, it basically says it fits right into industry 4.0 IIoT. Big buzzwords now, uh, a lot of companies are moving forward into these technologies, but what, and, and what it means basically is data, 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 um, and, and, and control, obviously. So IO-Link, uh, what happens with an IO-Link device versus a traditional version of, it, of the same thing? At the top, you have your traditional sensor, and again, going back to what I was saying earlier, is you're basically getting a present, not present, uh, whatever it may be, basically a one or a zero in, into the PLC, uh, depending on the, on the sensor. Now you can have that exact same sensor. And actually a lot of times what you find on the market now is that the, the, the sensor that you have been buying may actually have an IOLink interface that the chipsets are so inexpensive. They put them in, uh, just from a manufacturing standpoint, you're just, not, you may not be utilizing it. Um, but if you, if you connect it via IO link and you're connecting this obviously back to a master module, now you have, you know, at your fingertips, you've got a lot more data diagnostics, uh, in both directions, parameters, um, going down and diagnostics coming back. So basically what you're finding is that, you know, your know, temperature vibration, uh, the actual voltages and currents possibly counts of of a sensor, um, a, a, a manifold uh, valve, whatever it may be. Um, event data, you can actually get things to the point where the lens, uh, the reflectivity of, of a, a sensor is degrading. Um, and I'm gonna touch on that in a second. That kind of gets itself into uh, preventative maintenance or even predictive maintenance. Okay, so the big thing that IOLink brings to the, brings to the table is diagnostics and knowing what's out there and being able to control what's actually out there. Uh, this is just an example of uh, the parameter uh, data. And 
in the IELTS spec, anybody that comes out with a, a master module has to have built into it what's called a data storage functionality or a parameter server. And what that is, is once you enable it, you can actually take and, and suck up the parameters off of a device. It stores them in the master module. And if you swap that device with a device, it has to be in basically the same part number. I don't wanna say identical because that, there is a, a means to know based, based on a serial number, is it identical? But basically it's compatible. It's a compatible device. Um, and once you plug that in, it knows that and it automatically sends down the parameters. So in this case here, usually when a traditional pressure transducer is, is replaced, maintenance has to either you know, go to a set of drawings, there's a placard hand, you know, hanging next to a, a pressure transducer, but he's setting set points, scaling, hysteresis. Um, there's many things you can set inside of a, a pressure transducer. Um, he doesn't have to touch the, you can actually lock out the, the buttons on the front so they can't adjust anything. Um, but basically those parameters are, are, are downloaded automatically on, on Connect. Okay. And that's basically, like I say, that, that's functionality that every master module has to have. And every IOLIC device will have parameters of some sort. It depends on the device, what they are and how extensive they are. Uh, the more intelligent devices have a lot more parameters. Some may only just have a handful. But regardless, it, it, it handles the parameters. This just shows an overview of kind of a smart factory today. Uh, really no different than it's been for decades. Uh, but you have an, it, basically your upper architecture. You'll come down into your plant uh, through managed switches. And then you'll get down onto the plant floor into your PLCs and, and robot controllers. Um, what this kind of shows is where IO-Link is where IO-Link plays. So basically below the PLC, below the robot controllers is where IO-Link, we're not, we're not playing above the PLC. We're not trying to compete with PLCs or robot controllers. We need them. And also, again, we need the field bus from them. Um, but the IO-Link expansion area is basically below that. It's your distributed IO. Uh, around your cell, your machine, your tool, whatever your, your process may be. Uh, but that basically just shows you uh, where the IO link, where IO link plays. Okay. Then we get into logic, basically power, power to IO link devices. So we're going to go back to the, the PC analogy where everybody's familiar with USB. So basically we've got a PC and we've got a device plugged in. Uh, same thing, we've got an IOLink master module and we've got a device plugged in. And in this scenario, the, the, the device is getting power and communications from one cable. Okay, so basically your, your phones, you don't need two cables, you don't need a power cable and a communication cable. You're getting it through both. Many devices out there on the market, uh, especially input devices, uh, are a one cable interface, but you have the ability um, to basically go to external power. So same with the PC and we just show the printer just because there's a communication cable, but because of the, the, the power consumption, you need an external power source. Um, same thing out there on the plant floor. There are, there are current limits to masters. Uh, an industry standard is, is two amps for a, an IOLIC master port. Uh, sometimes they, they're, they're less than that. Um, not too often are, are they more than that. So, but this just shows you that you can drive something that requires a lot of power with IOLIC. It's just that you have an IOLIC communications cable and you've got power coming from an external source, but really no different than the, the, the PC analogy. Um, and this just kind of shows the logic versus auxiliary, just kind of expanding on it. Your logic power is generally used for all your inputs. It, it's always for communications, but normally inputs are very, very low current. Um, and you can, you can certainly supply a device that is collecting inputs, uh, whether it be analog, whether it be discrete. Um, 
whatever it might be. Basically, that can be powered with logic power. But there are some things that use outputs. Um, and valves is, is kind of where, where Parker plays. And basically, AUGS power is always something that has to be discussed. Um, how much current is, is, do we need? Um, what can the master provide? Is it, is it safe? Does it have to be safe power? Uh, is safe power uh, common with uh, logic power? Um, all, all questions that need to be asked, and it can all be handled. There's, there's solutions for all of these. So basically what happens is, um, basically there's a, a definition, and this is an IOLINK spec definition. There's a class A versus a class B. Um, so on a, on a four standard, just getting back to our standard tool cord, this is actually the pinout of a standard tool cord, um, a device pinout, I should say, not the cable itself, but a device pinout. And where pin one is your plus 24 volts, pin three is your common, pin four is normally your IO point one. So um, your sensors that are normally put out there are coming in on, on pin four. That in most, uh, in IP67, uh, industrial, let's say, input modules, um, if you put a T or a splitter cable, the sensors are all coming in on pin four with the, the, the I.O. point. What a splitter cable does is on the second sensor, it's taking pin four and through the, the splitter or through the T, it's routing at the pin two. So basically uh, on a standard pin out, again, pin one is 24 volts, pin three is your common. Pin four in an I.O. link uh, scheme, becomes the communication to the IO link device. So that's no longer available as a discrete point. Um, so really IO link uh, can be used with what we call a three, con a three conductor cable. Um, I don't like to throw that out there because when people hear three conductor uh, configuration, they, they, they envision or they think it's just three pins, which is a totally different cable and a totally different connector, but it's not, it's, it's a four conductor, um, and the five conductor is usually a center pin. Most of the time that's not used. Um, but pin four is the IO link communications to the device. Pin two is still available as an IO point uh, generally. Um, and that's where we get into class A cl versus class B. Uh, and, but, so, but in a class B scenario, it utilizes pin five. And what it does is that pin five now becomes the common for pin two. So now you can supply power, whereas in the class A, pin three was the common for pin two. Uh, so, so now your logic power and your aux power, the commons are common. Basically, it can come from one power supply. Um, not always desirable if you, are, if you actually have a, a safe uh, circuit to where you actually have two power supplies that are actually galvanically isolated from each other. The class B is what handles that. So, Pin five, that common, which is common for pin two, the output power is galvanically isolated from pin three, which is the common for logic power. Okay, so basically we can, we can handle safe scenarios uh, as well. When I say we, meaning IOLINK. Um, this just kind of shows, shows some hardware. Uh, on the left side here, this is actually a class A. So basically communications is coming from, this is an IP67 master. Uh, the communications is coming from the IOLINK cable. Um, the power is actually coming externally from a, a power source. It just so happens to be the same power supply that's powering the master in this, in this scenario. Uh, it does not have to be. Um, in the class B, you'll notice that the power coming, that's supplying the, the master does not make its way to the device itself. Those power connectors are eliminated and it's actually getting power through the IOLINK cable, which is the, the tool cord, the unshielded tool cord. Um, but now it's actually utilizing uh, pin five and pin two as that output power over the same cable. Okay, so that's just kind of showing you the difference between class A and class B. Um, whenever you've got input devices, they're always, they're just, they're always gonna be class A. Class B only comes into play when you're talking output, outputs themselves, um, then you, Class B comes into play, and then you have to have the discussion of how we're going to supply that power. Um, this is actually just showing uh, 
network variations. And the biggest thing is the IP67 versus IP20. Um, most, because I, IO Link is designed to be a distributed modular IO scenario. Um, most devices out there are IP67, uh, maybe IP65, they even get into IP69 uh, for, for the food and beverage industry. But you do have some IP20. Obviously, IP20 has got to be in an enclosure of some sort. It's got to be protected. Um, but what you, the scenario you have to think of there is if my master is going to reside in an enclosure, any IO link device I have outside that enclosure, now that cable's got to be routed down to a terminal strip, out through a cord grip or a bulkhead, and then connectorized out to the device. A lot of expense is, is put in there. So you can actually even have a combination of these two to where the PLC can actually have a, an IO-Link module. If there is actually uh, IO-Link devices inside uh, a panel, and for instance, let's say a motor starter inside the panel, you can have an IO-Link interface to a motor starter. And if you had the IO-Link master outside the panel, now you have to route that out. Same thing as routing the others in. But you could have a, a, a four port master inside and then actually go out and distribute to as many masters on the outside as you want, picking up all of your distributed IO in the field itself. Okay, but, but, I, but IO link is designed to be distributed in the field. So you'll, you'll see most things are IP67. That's basically the IO link stuff. Um, this is where we get a, a little bit of a commercial. Um, we're trying to do just a general IO link um, overview. Um, but Parker has, this is where, this is where I'm going to talk about other many, many manufacturers that are participants in the, the IO link, uh, consortium. They're taking existing product and they're offering it with an IO link interface. Parker is no different. So we've got existing products that have been around for a while. And now we are uh, replacing the heads, offering uh, a different head module that has the IO link interface. And again, a very common scenario nowadays, um, just to keep up. Uh, it's the IO link um, consortium. Like they, they they track things like like the Profi community uh, used to do with Profi Bus. They would start out with a a graph, have years at the bottom, have nodes up the y axis, and then show you this uh, this rising trend, exponential usually. Um, as years go on, just the, the number of nodes being purchased and used, uh, they started doing this. Actually, they did it with Profibus. They did the same thing with Profinet, and they're doing the same thing with, with IO-Link. And if you look at it, it's an exponential, and it's still ticking up, um, and it's going to for years. Um, and that's just where IO-Link, the, the acceptance of IO-Link uh, is, and uh, manufacturers and people are going to just continue to support it. So it's not like you know putting this in, you know, in, in a year or two, or my next generation machine, I'm going to be doing something different. Uh, nobody sees IOLink going anywhere because of how powerful it is. So, uh, this is actually just a slide showing, say, I did mention safe power. Um, they're actually IOLink. And again, I mentioned earlier that it's been around for a, a, about 12, 14 years. Um, it, it never had an IOLink uh, portion to the specification. But the end of 2019, they finally came out with their IO-Link safety spec. So now what you're going to start seeing, if you haven't already, you're going to basically you're going to see IO-Link safe devices. I don't show them on this slide. I'm just letting you know this is where the, the market's going. But because it's so new, uh, I, I, I can't really give an example of somebody who's brought an IO-Link safety device to market yet, but they're, they're, they're coming. And because the spec has been released, now manufacturers can start designing to it. But what you're going to have is you're going to have light curtains, you're going to have e stops, you're going to have safety mats, whatever it might be that actually will now pass through an IO Link master module on its way back to a safety PLC that always has to be there. Um, but you don't need a, a safety controller uh, or a connection back to a safe module back to the PLC. Um, so you, you, you will see that. But right now, uh, because of the galvanic isolation between logic power and the AUGS power, 
the basically IOLINK devices can handle safe power. Okay, it's just that it's not, they're not safety rated devices. Okay, uh, the value proposition is, is what is IOLINK giving you? You know, what am I getting out of it? Um, and it's not even, normally you not even have, you don't have to talk about, you know, I'm paying, I'm paying more money, what am I getting for, for my money? Because it's usually a more economical solution anyways, it just comes along with it. So basically we talk about preventative maintenance, predictive maintenance. Um, and so the IOLINK interface isn't just again, a discrete uh, on off or just even, even an analog position of, of something, just a basically uh, a value, uh, a decimal value coming back, giving you feedback of something. You have process data and you have parameter data. And in these two types of data, and I'll break it down in a second here, you have diagnostics that can help you with preventative maintenance and also help you with predictive maintenance. Um, process data is your, is your cyclic data, which means it's exchanged every uh, number of milliseconds. Um, and with, with the PLC, uh, as, you, as you lay out a PLC, basically you're gonna have a scan time of your PLC, you have control, over the interval at which the PLC will communicate to a, a field bus device. And then you've got the field bus device and the update rate of it collecting information, in this case from the Outlook Master, collecting information from the devices connected to it. And the, the, the time that it takes for the devices to exchange data with the master is on about a two, two to five second millisecond uh, time frame. And, but normally that's faster than uh, you're usually getting data between a, a PLC and, and a uh, field bus device anyways. That's normally usually on a, a 10 millisecond uh, time frame. Um, so the, the update rate, uh, it, it's not, you know, I've always thrown out, and again, this is in my, my previous history, is there are applications that you have to be concerned. You have to ask the questions. Those normally came up in the, the, the bottling industry, uh, cigarettes, where you needed very quick update speeds. IOLINK is, is, is probably not your solution. But those are rare. Uh, in, in most of the other stuff, you know, you don't need things in a half a millisecond or a millisecond or two. You know, four or five milliseconds is perfectly acceptable. Um, and that's where IOLINK plays in. Um, but in the process data, again, that's exchanged cyclically, you can actually get diagnostic data. You can actually get overload, uh, short circuit information. Um, because IOLINK devices are, are smart, once you, when you connect them, basically the information that's passed up is you get a, a vendor ID of whose product it actually is. You'll get a device ID. Uh, it's basically based on a part number. To, to know what is connected. If maintenance goes and swaps an IOLINK master for some reason, and they get two of the tables uh, crossed, you can, it, it's very easy in a PLC to detect that, to know that, and throw, in, throw up an HMI diagnostic port mismatch at IOLINK master such and such, port such and such. So basically you know what is connected, um, and that comes in cyclic data. Uh, and it also your, all of your IO, is, is in cyclic data, but you can also get diagnostics in cyclic data as well. In parameter data, which is acyclic, that's on demand. So parameter data it does, does not come in intervals. Basically, you set up uh, programming to either read or write parameter data. Um, and additional diagnostics can come in your acyclic data, um, event, you know, more detailed events, maybe a history of, of events, can, can certainly come in acyclic data. The parameters that you're writing down to, to, to basically set up the device. Uh, in, in the example we used earlier was the, the pressure transducer. That is acyclic data. And, and what, I, what I mentioned at that point was there's a parameter server functionality that can be built into the, the master. If you can actually choose to not use that and do that functionality in the PLC. So you know when a device is connected, you, want to, you know when a device is disconnected, and on connect, you can look at the device ID, 
the vendor ID. If it's the same device, you can actually write the parameters down that you choose. That would be an example of something that may change. Um, pressure as, as machines wear, pressure settings wear, uh, whatever it might be. If that's something that, or if, it, if it, you can set up the functionality to change it on the HMI. You can bump something up, bump something down. Then basically uh, with acyclic data, you can write that parameter down. Um, so now the PLC becomes a master of the parameters. Uh, you can, that's just two ways of accomplishing the same thing. Uh, just to, know, to show you the versatility of, of IOM. Um, this is just a, just a kind of a cut sheet of uh, process data. Um, this is the cyclic data you get. Um, every, again, every, every number of milliseconds, you're gonna get this information. Um, and this is, not to go into detail, but device okay is a bit written from an AOI that compares the vendor ID and device ID to the device ID that was configured for that port. And it tells you whether that's connected or not, or whether there is a mismatch, <laughs> mismatch fault, um, communication fault, or if it's not connected. But this is just an example of uh, some of the, the process data, uh, parameter data. Um, and again, this, isn't stuff, this is not data that you need cyclically or fast. You may want it every couple minutes, uh, every once a shift, um, on demand. You might want to, you could have an HMI button that you press <laughs> that goes and retrieves information for you. That would be an example of parameter data or, or acyclic data. Um, I think cycle counts, I actually, I, I pick up a little bit later here. So we'll talk about that in a second. Um, this is basically prognostic diagnostic information. This is just to show you an example of diagnostic information. Um, of course, we're gonna use a, a Parker product, but keeping in mind that anybody who's got an IOLINK device out there has uh, diagnostic data that, that, it, that it provides. And I, if you just look in the manual, they, they'll always detail it. They'll give you the information on how to retrieve it. Uh, Inform, you know, information about its ranges, whatever it may be. But this is just an example. And down in the lower right here, basically we just show that errors and warnings is process data. The voltage value is parameter data. So basically, uh, and again, this, the, the process data is, is cyclic. You're getting it all the time. But if you want to turn around based on, let's say a flag, you may want to go get the actual value. And again, you don't need that all the time. You don't want, you don't have to waste the bandwidth getting that cyclically just when necessary. So this is just an example of some, there's gonna be a couple slides here that show different types of diagnostic data uh, over temperature, um, vibration, uh, people are building into their, their IO-Link devices. Uh, this is all stuff that with, with traditional uh, interfaces or sensors, you didn't get. It was just, even the traditional valve manifold interface was, you basically have an array of, of bits and you tell it what, what valve you want to turn on, you turn it on and you turn it off. That was really the only interface that you had. You didn't know the temperature. You didn't even know sometimes if it's even connected or not. Um, but basically this, this just gives you a lot more information. Uh, and again, in this, this example, we were just showing temperature. Uh, here again is, is diagnostics as far as short circuit. Uh, or even possibly, I think overload I've got on the next one. But again, you have a, a cyclic or in process data, you've got a flag that says, I've got a problem, then you can turn right back around and ask it for more detailed information that you don't get cyclically. Okay. Um, and this, this then an overcurrent is another example of, and that is, that's process data. So you, you are getting it all the time. You'll know that immediately if you have an overcurrent. Um, counters. Actually, this is normally this would be handled in the PLC if you had a situation to where you needed to know the number of cycles on possibly a die press applications uh, for re for repair purposes, um, whatever it might be. The PLC uh, or maybe in the robot controller would keep track of this. Now the IOLINK device can retain this information. Um, and you can use its parameter data because again, it's depending on how many valves, you've got a lot of counters in there. You don't wanna waste the bandwidth to get those every couple of milliseconds because you, do, you don't care 
except maybe once a shift, uh, maybe once a week, who knows. But you can ask for the, the cycle counts on any of your valves at, at any time. Um, but the PLC does not have to retain that information. You don't have to write the logic, uh, waste the memory to do it. The device actually retains it for you. Um, this is just programming support. Um, and th this, is, this is Parker, but most people that are putting IO Link uh, devices or masters out there are providing programming support. Um, in a Rockwell scenario, uh, it's usually add-on profiles or add-on instructions. Um, and basically, if you're not familiar with, with AOIs or AOPs, basically it's a canned subroutine uh, that's obviously very specific to the device or the master uh, that, it's, that it's written for. So it saves you a tremendous amount of programming from going to a manual, looking at a mapping, setting up your own tags, uh, and de defining that, it just, it, it hands it to you. Um, in, a, in a Siemens, uh, Mitsubishi, and Amron, it's function blocks. Um, so basically, most manufacturers provide some type of pro programming support. Uh, at Parker, we do provide for a Valif master and an IFM master uh, for the Rockwell. We do provide AOIs for this. Again, it saves a tremendous amount of, uh, of programming time. Um, this is, this is a slide we just like to throw up. Um, the communications to an IO link device is defined, predefined, and most people are familiar with uh, ESD files or GSD, XML files, um, defining the interface uh, between a PLC and the device itself. The IODD file is the, basically the ESD uh, or the GSD equivalent for that. Um, the DDS, sorry. Um, and basically that, that's got the definition. The IODD files are not required to interface uh, to a device, to a PLC. This is strictly uh, a diagnostic to be used um, for troubleshooting, uh, maybe definition or whatnot, but it is not required uh, to be used to, uh, to interface. That kind of goes through basically IO link tried to keep it as general as possible. Uh, obviously, Parker is getting into uh, the IO link. We've been in it for a bit. We're continuing to develop product on our, on our roadmap. We've got things that are, that are coming up um, to continue uh, enhancing our, our portfolio of IO link devices. Um, but that hopefully, that gives you a, a, a scenario and again, depending on whether you've not heard of BioLink, whether you've used it, if you have used it, maybe you picked out some things maybe you didn't know. Um, but that's basically IOLink in a, in a, in a nutshell. Um, I'll throw it back to, are there any uh, other any questions at this point? So Jim, I'm actually, um, uh, there's ability, if you guys have any questions, you could either chat with us or you have the ability to raise your hand. If you raise your hand, I can unmute you and you can talk to us directly. So it's kind of up to you if there's any questions. Uh, again, if um, there's not any immediate questions, but you may have something after the fact, we're certainly gonna uh, um, you know, share this link and give some contact information so you can reach out to us directly. Um, we can go in further detail, maybe some products or technology, wherever you might have, or just challenges. So um, if there's anybody out there, certainly go ahead and, and raise your hand. Um, I don't see anyone in the chat box yet, but I'll give another another minute. If not, um, oh, we got somebody here. Oh, just saying, I got a nice thank you there. Thank you. Um, so saying thank you and, and very informative. So I'm glad to hear that we're finding this is um, um, useful for everybody. And um, again, if, uh, if there's really nothing else, we, we just want to thank everybody for uh, attending today and um, wish the best of luck and, and hopefully we'll, we'll hear from you or talk to you again soon. All right, well, uh, uh, thank you very much, Ben, and also uh, Jim and Ushwin, thank you for your time. And I believe um, that everyone um, who received the link to this uh, webinar um, has my contact information. So again, this is Pete Whaler at the RG Group. You should have my email and phone number. 
Um, so certainly if there are any specific questions, specific applications you'd like to, dis to discuss with me, feel free, um, reach out to me. Uh, again, uh, you know, I'm pretty read readily available by phone and email. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. And again, uh, if we have to go back and chat further with Jim and Ushwin, uh, we certainly have those resources available as well. So thank you um, on my behalf as well. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Hopefully we'll talk to you soon.